Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. Oh, have I got a show for you today because I've got someone who was born and raised and has lived all his life in Texas. He married his college sweetheart, her name is Linda, and they've been married for over 30, yes, 30 years. My guest graduated with a BS and an M.E.D., yes, from East Texas State University. I know there's going to be a lot of people who are saying something about this, but he did, and he spent 33 years in public education as an agriculture teacher, principal, and retiring as a superintendent. He's been a member of the American Quarter Horse Association. He's been a member of the Texas Theater Adjudicator Organization. And he and his wife have closely worked with Texas students in the university interscholastic league. And so this is pretty exciting stuff because there's even more to my guest. I kid you not. This is such an honor to have him here because of his experience in education, everything he's giving to his community. And not only this, but he's authored children's books, Western novels, and a theatrical play. After retiring, he ended up taking his talents to the screen where he's appeared in AMC's The Sun, HBO's The Leftovers, and many others. He's an author, a writer, an actor, and he is a lifetime cowboy, cattle rancher. He does raise quarter horses, and he also has a vineyard, which I'm going to talk to him a little bit more about so that he can share with you all of these experiences. You may know him from Showdown on the Brazos, Showdown on the Guadalupe, Guadalupe, and I Heard the Quail Whistle. We want to talk to him about all these, so let's bring him on. Bill Foster, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I am absolutely overjoyed because you are such a contributing member to your community. You have such life value, the skills that we think of and know of when it comes to hometown, especially when it comes to hometown Texas and all of the things that surround that. And then you've taken these things and applied them so that they can be projected and utilized for children as well as on screen. This is phenomenal. And I really appreciate everything that you have done and the life that you've led. Thank you very much. That's been an experience for sure. <laughs> so let me ask you, many of us who are either in education or in some type of helping field, such as law enforcement, later end up coming into film or screen somehow into acting or in the film industry. So I'm wondering first how you got into education. Well, uh, when I graduated from high school, the industry was closing down. There wasn't a whole lot of jobs. And so we knew that it's kind of like being a mechanic. There's always going to be cars. And so it was an interest in uh, agriculture and kids. That made me uh, look and say, there's always going to be kids. There's always going to be a need, uh, job security. And so I could, you know, I knew I couldn't make a living on the farm. And so this was a way I could do the agriculture and still uh, make a living at it. So teaching kids and you know, high school kids, vocational agriculture is the way I started. Mm -hmm. And your grandfather was in this industry. He, my grandfather was a farmer, homesteader, a sharecropper, you name it. He, he did it back then. Yep. He, he actually moved to New Mexico from Texas in a covered wagon, homesteaded out there in the 20s, and then came back to Texas. Oh, isn't that interesting? There was a lot going back during that time period of moving and settling and trying to really make it. I mean, the times were really tough. And so this, this is pretty interesting what you have as far as history. And you got to learn a lot from your grandfather to carry on and pass down through not only generationally for yourself, but now you've taken it through the education and passed that information on to your students. And this is pretty incredible. You went on to now to go into film. How did that happen? <laughs> Just by luck. Uh, you know, uh, I always share the story. When I was about second grade, the teacher went around the room asking all the students what they wanted to be when they grew up. 
Well, my idol was uh, John Wayne and Elvis Presley. So I told him, I, I thought, I'm going to tell him I'm going to be a movie star. Well, the girl next to me said movie star, and everybody laughed at her. So I said, I'm not going to let everybody laugh at me. So I told him something else, you know. I didn't want them that laughing at me. But, you know, that was already in my mind back then. And so then I, then I went on, and uh, after I retired in January of 2016, I was just on Facebook and, and saw the open cast of Call for the Sun. So I thought, well, why not? I might get, you know, just a little bit of roll walking up the street or something. Little did I know I was going to end up with a featured extra and uh, be right there in the mix of, the, you know, a recurring character. And so then that kind of, you know, gets you a little – little taste of it and you want more and then it just seems like every time I applied for a, a movie as an extra I was getting in there and and uh, I read an article where it says if you want to do this you, you take everything from the free ones to the paying ones until until you kind of establish yourself and yes. so I took, took a lot of independence and got got my feet wet and that helped get me into the others along the way and then uh, I had written a script for somebody just bits and pieces and that never went anywhere, so I just pulled it all out and, and then evolved a whole movie around that, and that turned into Showdown on the Brazos. And so, then, yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you how that came about, because when I was doing some of my homework, and I was learning about, you know, Showdown on the Guadalupe, I was thinking to myself, did this actually become Showdown on the Brazos? And that, that was what I... I started thinking, or had there been a connection or a spin off? That that was what my initial thought was. Well, you're close. Uh, when I was working on this showdown on the Brazos, I couldn't think of a title, so I, I just said showdown on the Brazos. I said I'll change it later, and entered it in the contest. So when it won that contest last year, then then the title kind of stuck, and so here we are with two showdowns. And I know it's kind of confusing, and I probably would have named it something else if I'd known it had taken off so much, but. I kept thinking, well, one day I'll rename it, but little did I know it was going to take off like it did. And so that's how it ended up this way. What a blessing, though. It's really mm -hmm. such a good feeling when something that you do, you know is good, but you don't know how well receptive it's going to be. And then it just explodes. And you're just, I mean, over. I got chills just, just thinking about that. But it is such, such a blessing. And so... I, I kind of like that you have both of those things named the way they are because it says a lot about what's within them. Yes, it does. And we also could make it a series. <laughs> they tease yeah. us to show down on rivers as we go across Texas. But, you know, it does tie. I was looking for something to tie it to Texas. And uh, so the Brazos River has always been a, a, a part of me as, as I used to go fishing on it when I was a little kid. And, and so – it's always been in the back of my mind as, as a neat place to be. And so, uh, yeah, you talk about explode this thing started out. I was just going to do a live phone movie with a few actors. And, and now I've got a video crew with over 200 actors the time we're going to be through. So unbelievable. It, yeah. The script started out like 30 pages, but to enter it as a full length feature, it had to be over 51 or 50 pages. So I wrote it to 51 pages like a couple of years ago and entered that contest got honorable mention but now it's i look today it's 110 pages long now and and i'm also a finalist with it in the same contest because it's rewritten and then our trailer's a finalist and our poster's leading con poster contest right now so it's a uh, hopefully we can get a trifecta i love it this is fantastic okay you're talking about the Brazos River. So what I'd like to know, I'm going to correlate this back to something you're currently doing, and that's your vineyard. Do you use the water from the river? No, ma'am. No. No. It's, a, no, it's a well. We use it for a well. Ooh. Yeah, that's, and that's the reason we end up buying this place. We, when we were living it, when, uh, over by Brownwood, we drilled a well because we thought we were going to put it in over there, and we made seven gallons a minute of water, which had been marginal for a uh, vineyard. And but it had too many minerals in it for the for the grapes, and so we ended up buying this place, which it makes two hundred gallons a minute of water out of the well. Whoa! So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're saying like I just stand back two hundred yeah. gallons a minute? Oh yeah, it'll knock you down if you're standing in front of it. If you get the full force of it, it's like a fire hose. And so uh, we fill your big water tanks and then by gravity it drips out to the uh, drips it goes out to the drip system for the vines so uh 
you know, it, it doesn't take about, you know, just a little while to fill up the tanks. And then, like right now, they're out there soaking right now. So, uh, and that was plan B. You know, my wife, when I came in and said, well, then look, I'm going to have a vineyard. She said, well, what's plan B? And I said, I don't know. She said, we'll get one. And so uh, yes. that's, when, that's how we ended up actually moving closer to the grandkids, buying this property and uh, starting the vineyard here. I love the fact that you are doing all of the things that you love because you're still involved with educating others in addition to your filming and getting back into the agricultural part of your background. So it's kind of right at this moment, you have this very well-rounded, all experience, all encompassing of everything right here in your hands. I mean, this is absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone, Thank you I think at some point thinks, I wish I could have it all. All of the things that I have loved to do, all of the things that I've wanted to do, and all the things that would bless me. Mm -hmm. yep. There you and have it. You've got your family. You've got, I mean, just all of it. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I pinch myself every once in a while. You know, after spending 33 years in education and, you know, I have 33 years, to over 25 of it was in administration where me and Gerald call 24 seven. And so you don't have a whole lot of time for yourself and you try to work that time in. And so uh, when you, when I retired, that made it where I could do this, the vineyard and, and the movies and everything that I'd always thought about doing and more writing and things like that. And of course I started writing before I retired. I didn't start publishing until after I had, had retired. This is a really good point for me to share with the audience that with hard work, dedication to the things that you're doing, you can fulfill your dreams. And mm -hmm. sometimes it, it takes a little bit longer before you get there, but you can achieve them. And it can be a blessing. There's one thing that that bill you've had to do to make this dream come true and i want to share that with the audience when it comes to going from 23 to 3. okay you're downsizing oh yeah yeah that <laughs> yes uh you threw me there for saying yeah we were in a house like we were in a 2300 square foot home before we moved over to the vineyard and now we moved over here we're down to 300 square foot home so it, we went from a, too big of a house for just two of us to, I think it's the perfect size right now. You know, it's a, it's just a, uh, we would have built it, if we built it, we'd have built it a little bit different, but it was already a, 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 a building on my dad's property. And when we moved him in the rest home, we picked up that building oh. and brought it to the vineyard. And then I converted the inside of it to a, a living quarters. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's working great. And my wife likes it because I get to cook outside 90% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, the easier but, uh, to clean up too when you're doing it that way. But I want to share with the audience that some of the things to reach your dreams, you do have to make sacrifices for. And yes. so you have to look at our material things, the things that you absolutely need to have to fulfill your dreams. Do you need to maintain a 2,300 square foot house with things that are going to deteriorate within them over time? and that you have to replace often and so your money is funneled into those things or can you utilize the best in minimizing certain things so that you can focus and apply the surplus to things that will help you achieve other dreams and this is something that you have done and I really am pointing this out to the audience because you are living proof that you can do all of these things yes when we got ready move we found out we had so much we did not need uh we ended up donating uh, we i have a 24 foot stock trailer we donated three trailer loads of you could call it junk it was just surplus or whatever to a good friend that has garage sales for a living and, and helped her out and so uh you know that that's just stuff we didn't need that was just sitting around that and of course we still have some storage rentals that right now that we have some things, you know, some furniture in it that we didn't want quite get rid of. But, but you know, all that other stuff that we really don't need, uh, you know, how many coats do you need? How many pairs of jeans do you need? You know, yes. uh, things yeah. like that. We tend to hold on to things for a number of reasons. Sometimes they're mm -hmm. sentimental. 
and sometimes they're to fulfill another void sometimes they're out of habit but whatever it is if we can identify that and help us address those things and then refocus onto something else that's going to actually be more fruitful positive and healthy we can begin to make a shift where it's going to really be blessings after mm -hmm. blessings after blessings so Speaking of blessings, little blessings out there, children, let's talk about your children's books for a minute. Okay. Tell yes. me about these. Yeah, I started writing, uh, I wrote a novel and, and wasn't having much luck getting it published. Of course, it was a first novel that when you make all your first novel mistakes as you as you're an author, you know. And I was an elementary principal at the time, so I thought, why don't I write children's books as, as a, uh, see if I can get those published. And so I started out writing, and it's called the Willie series, uh, because the very first one is the boy who wouldn't comb his hair. And because my son at the time was in first grade, and he did not want to comb his hair, and so we had to keep a fur haircut all the time. And so I wrote this book about it, and the kids loved it when I and they eventually had it published, and the kids at school loved it when I would read it to them. And so then it just turned into a series. And I've had two posts. I've written, I think, 10 or 11 of the series. But uh, I've been focusing more on my novels. But the teachers would have read-in day every year. Well, they would expect a new book every year. And so I would have to write a new Willie story for them every year. And so uh, that's, that's how I ended up with so many of them. And it's always about the same first grader and how much trouble he can get into. And, and there's always a little lesson to go along with it. So. You know, maybe it's not an outwardly lesson. Sometimes uh, the children's books get too too much like that, too preachy. I just wanted to have the kids enjoy it when they read it and have a good time. And so maybe they learn a little bit from it. Do you think you could take that over and put it on screen? Uh, probably could, yeah. Definitely a cartoon version of it or even a, a, a movie for little kids too. Yes. So yeah, it definitely could be done that way. Yep. I think that would be really neat. You have a lot of very good experience, a lot of wisdom. You've seen a lot of things throughout your life. And these, these things you're conveying to children are so important. We oftentimes forget about what is important to children and their mm -hmm. perception. And so the delivery of things that we want them to do or the things they need to be compliant for in society, the way we deliver the message is huge. Yes. And yeah. it can really have a huge effect on their self-esteem and how their future behavior um, is displayed and can affect other members of society, including, I mean, just even when it comes to bullying in the school system. Yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, the books to me are, are like, a, like a movie. It's a time for you to escape from reality and enjoy. And so that's why when the kids read the book, they can, that 30 minutes, they can escape and just get into the story and, and enjoy a, a story about a little boy and laugh about him and, and how much trouble he can get into and things like that. And then when it's over, you feel good, you know, hopefully. So, uh, so you wrote this based upon your son. Now let's, correlate this to a film that you did called The Sun. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, The Sun, that was an amazing experience. Uh, we got to start, or I, we got to work right along the star at Pierce Brosnan. And uh, that was the first day of filming. I was so scared and nervous, you know, thinking, my goodness, you know, here, James Bond, 007, whatever, you know, I'm <laughs> going to get to go in and work with him. And and uh, I told a friend of mine in one of our play teachers, I, I couldn't tell them who, but I said, I'm fixing to go in. I'm, they said, hey, they're just as human as you are. So that really calmed me down and, and got to go in there and just found out these are just people just like me and you. And, and they've got a talent for acting and you work along them and your job is to make them look as good as possible in the scene. And, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, we filmed several days on that. I think I was in five episodes of the 10. And so got to play a bad guy in fact the first day of filming I told my wife I said you're not gonna like my character because he, he's not a nice person and so uh, you do that found out you know sometimes we can film for eight hours and then you get on screen it's 30 seconds or maybe a minute you know got to, you know that was a shock to me yes 
you're like, I invested all of this time and this is what I got exactly. out of it. <laughs> but, but I love all the way from costuming to makeup, you know, from the time you get there, from the time you get your costume picked out to getting there and get, I love all of it, you know, the, the getting ready for it, the, the staging it. It's all fun to me right now. I have to agree with you because I've done some things on set and every part of it is fun. And the one thing I can share with the audience is everything is about your perception and what you make of it. Mm -hmm. So while you might have some experiences that are long and arduous, if you, if you can take and really sort of filter the things that are going to be beneficial to you, you can, you can make those things good experiences or at least yes. take something good from those experiences. Yeah, there, there were some young people usually on set that they'd, they'd be griping about whether it's having to stand in line for makeup or whatever. And I just always try to make a joke out of it because, you know, you enjoy every bit of it, you know. Yeah, sometimes, you know, we film 12, 14, 17 hours or however long it takes and you just work that long or the overnight shoots are really tough, you know not used to work staying up all night, but uh, you just, you just keep on rocking through it and you just try to enjoy every bit of it. And a little bit of twist, uh, there was, I believe four other men with me in our group on the sun that we were in this gang of bad guys. And I told them when, when I said, I said, guys, if we have, if I ever make a movie, y'all are going to be in it. And so I got all four of them into the movie on showdown of the prizes. So, oh, wonderful. So we were able to get them all back in there, get us all back together into the movie. So that, that was a pretty neat deal to get them all back in there. So what project or projects are you currently devoting your time on? Showdown on the Brazos is taking all of it right now. I did a Robert Rodriguez movie the other day, uh, just a one day shoot. And then uh, I filmed a couple of days for some friends that was doing a movie. But 90% of my show, business movie businesses show down on the brazos right now we like about one full day and about three half days and then we'll be wrapped as far as filming and it'll go into post-production i and love it we're filming tomorrow on the brass actual brazos river and it's an actual scene where i'll be in the river most of the most of the morning so maybe i won't get too shriveled up but i'll be in the coolest place everybody else will be in the sweat and i'll be out there in the river there you <laughs> go and all the ladies get some eye candy in the meantime there you go. I'm wearing a big <laughs> evening suit, so. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. This has been so very, I mean, just peaceful and warm. You have got so many things to share and deliver that people can use, and you're doing it in a number of ways that, I, as, I, as I've said at the beginning, I appreciate you, and I know that there are so many others that do. And I'm encouraging you through your retirement years to keep on because this is what I know I'm passionate about as a retire, retired person and helping others, delivering things and still being able to be fulfilled at the same time. And I am encouraging you to continue to do the same. And I thank, thank you very much for doing. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. Let me ask you, where can the audience find all, all of the information on how to follow you, see uh, Showdown on the Brazos, everything? Oh, well, we have a trailer on YouTube. You just type in Showdown on the Brazos. Uh, I was excited when that when it first put it on Facebook. We had 300 views, but with combined Facebook and YouTube, it's over 13,000 now. So you can see our trailer there. Uh, you can go to my Facebook page, either Bill Foster or Showdown on the Brazos. And we post uh, behind the scene pictures all the time. And I know a lot of the big productions don't do that, but I, I want to get show people, you know, what goes on behind the scenes and how much fun we're having. And, and it's, we actually call it our movie family. And in fact, my grandkids are in the movie and they'll ask my granddaughter who's five, she'll say, what's my movie teacher doing? Because she was in school scene with her, with a teacher and she calls it her movie teacher or her, or her movie sister, you know? So, uh, so you can check in those three locations, Bill Foster or Showdown on the Brazos or Facebook or go to YouTube to see our trailer. I love it. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's been a blast. Thank you so much for having me. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to another episode of Rebecca Sounds Revely. You definitely want to follow Bill, check out what he's got going on, like his YouTube channel, and check 
all of the things that's going on behind the scenes on Facebook and do the same with Rebecca Sounds Reveille. Please share this episode with all of your friends, family, loved ones, everybody you know on social media and those you don't. Rebecca Sounds Reveille. What a show I have for you because I have a returning guest who has really helped thousands of people in reference to finances. In fact, it's pretty incredible because he has a very tailored sense of what he does and how he goes about doing it. He is the president of Arbor Financial and he's also the author of Turning Financial Planning Right Side Up. And this has been a bestseller. It has helped thousands of readers master the inside game of investing as well as avoiding things, Wall Street and media bias, such as, well, he'll tell you more about that. He's a market watcher, energy analysis. Um, he also occasionally hosts the national TV show, The Income Generation, and much more. He's got a lot to talk about today that I want to share with you, and I'd like to bring him on the show now. With me today, Jeffrey Small. Welcome to the show. Hey, Rebecca. Thank you for having me back. Well, I am just absolutely delighted with what you have going on because you are on the move and you have always been focused on dedicating to your clients a boutique style of financial investing. And so this has gone on to do very well with you in a diverse way of the how you offer financial products to your clients. Can you share with us a little bit about that? Well, sure. Um, you know, the financial culture, uh, really from my industry's perspective, and if you work with Charles Schwab or Fidelity or Vanguard, or you have a broker down at Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley or Ameriprise, it's all pretty much the same. They're all pretty much offering the same thing. And so Unfortunately, though, investors are unaware of the fact that there are plenty of other options out there other than what everybody offers on a regular basis. And so our firm provides the alternative to what everybody else promotes. And um, I think that there's a lot of material in the answer to that question. Um, but to put it in perspective, to look what's happening in the markets today, that we've hit this all-time peak, we are a late-stage, end cycle bull market. The global economy is slowing down. We have a China trade war issue. Our own economy is starting to moderate a tad, not growing as fast as it did last year. These are all warning signs that are really uh, causing what I would call a bond proxy in stocks, meaning people are looking for dividends, they're looking for yields, they're looking for stability. And what our firm does on a boutique basis is we offer the same type of institutional fixed income investing that a multi-million dollar portfolio would get for Main Street America. And that was really one of the premises of my book. And so by offering that to Main Street America, we offer them a different or alternate form of investing that all the big firms, either discount brokers or non-discount brokers, continually promote, which is a risk on mentality. And to have risk on today, I think is going to be painful for the average investor from Main Street. So let me ask you, when you are talking about the terms in terms of average investor, for those listening, what do you mean by that? Well, I think that um, people are only as good with their money as they, as, they, as they seek counsel on, and the people that are giving counsel are only as good as they've had the training. The reality is that the market is pretty much finite in terms of what it offers, and so investors don't have the ability, and we're talking about the average everyday retiree, the average everyday millennial, the average everyday uh, generation Xer. It doesn't really matter what your size or status is. If you have savings, that's really Main Street America, and that's what I'm referring to. And so they kind of herd Main Street up as cattle and overpromote risk and tell them that if you want growth, you've always got to have risk. Well, that only works half of the time going back the last 130 years in market history. The other half of the time, what happens is it doesn't work. And so what we do is we teach Main Street America, the inside game of that perspective, but we show them ways 
to master their money to reflect the state of the markets or what I call modernize their money to reflect the state of the markets. And so where people should be shifting today, Rebecca, and what we do from a boutique standpoint is we are hyper yield interest rate dividend focused, but we are not stock market specific. So the average portfolio in our office here will be generating greater than a 5% net yield after fees, but they'll be 85% uncorrelated or disconnected entirely from the stock market, if not more than that as a percentage. And so that is where folks today should be modern with their money. And that's already happening in the markets today. If you watch CNBC, if you watch Fox Business News, you watch Bloomberg, you watch the major financial networks, everybody is, is searching for a bond proxy in stocks, which is very a very risky game because stock prices go up and down and your dividend can be wiped out in a day. So if you're getting yes. a 4% dividend, the dividend can just evaporate in one day like it did today. So most stocks are down 3 to 4% today. So let me ask you too, for those that are getting started to get confused about this and Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, um, should they focus mostly on talking to a financial advisor to make a game plan as far as stock purchasing, how this affects their retirement? I think that they, you know, what I always tell everybody is they should go out and find three advisors. And I even tell my, my own prospective or potential customers this. They should find three advisors. They should show them their best, their best risk-off approach with their highest yield derived. And so if they can get a four or 5% net yield and be risk off, then that's a good advisor. And that's really what people are looking for. But, but the, the problem is, Rebecca, nine out of 10 advisors that somebody goes and sees are gonna say, we've gotta put 60% of your money in stocks. We've gotta put 40% in bonds. And we're gonna use this probability study that says, you know, you're gonna have a 50% chance of having some money left in 30 years after you pull out 3% a year. And that's, that's just not where folks should be today. That's, that's, that's incorrect today. Right. And so what do you think about the terms of what people are saying in reference to what they're seeing as far as the, I don't know, precipice of a recession or do you think that's coming? Well, I think that, you know, the economy is, is really conflicted. Interest rates are going to be getting dramatically lower. We're going to zero. Uh, the global banks, European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the Bank of China, they're all going, well, bank, most of them are already at zero. We're, we're going to zero. Um, and that's going to spur lots of consumerism. Now, where is the consumerism? The consumerism today is with the 88 million millennials that we have today. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're going to be the ones that are going to benefit from having such low interest rates. Retirees, they've downsized. They're not really spending. They're not interested in having lots of credit. They don't want mortgages on their house. And so that's really not going to benefit the economy very much. So we're going to see more consumerism. But as the economy starts to slow down and the long-term trend in, in aging, the long-term demographic pattern there is we see more deflation than we will inflation and less consumerism in the next decade. Okay. That to weigh on the economy every year, we're going to see that become a heavier weight. Yes. In five pounds of less consumerism due to the aging population and the downsizing that occurs because there aren't enough millennials to make up the gap. And so we have this tug of war that's going to happen and we're going to create an environment where there's going to be massive fiscal stimulus and massive monetary policy stimulus to try and keep asset prices and stocks and real estate high due to that tug of war that's going to occur because we don't have the demographics that we had in the 80s that we had in the 90s. So if people think that we're in that bull market and that the party's just going to keep going on, they're going to be really get ready for major heartbreak on their money. And so I think uh, that's what we can expect. And so as you try and figure out all this information, if you're a consumer by watching the news and seeing news pieces, just understand the long-term trend in aging and demographics is to undermine the economy and lower consumerism. And if that happens, then companies aren't making as much money, their net profits shrink, the impetus to invest in the markets and for stocks to rise just is not there because the economy will essentially be flatlining. We won't have growth in the economy next decade. So what do you think the best method to address this is? 
the best method is everybody needs to go out and start having babies. <laughs> so, because that's the problem. Um, we are depopulating. We are not increasing the population fast enough. We've got 180,000 people a month leaving the workforce. And so this year we're going to average about 140 to 150,000 new jobs being created. So we have more people leaving the workforce than we do uh, coming into the workforce. And so we have a sucking sound of, 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 a, of a subtraction of total amount of people working, even though today the employment numbers are the best they've ever been since for 50 years. And so we have more people working today than ever before, but because of the aging trends over the next 10 years, that number is going to contract. Well, that's pretty interesting. And now how does this correspond to the sort of mawless America now that we're starting to see and the major explosion in online purchases? Well, I think it's all about simplicity. Um, nobody wants to go shopping at Christmas and the holidays because it's drudgery dealing with all the crowds. Yes. Dealing with, you know, parking and then having to get something to eat and then you've got to walk so far. It's so much easier to buy things online. But I think the, the stores of the future will be bricks and clicks. I think long-term bricks and clicks like Walmart will usurp or beat Amazon at some point. Right now, Amazon's just kind of the mecca for online retailing. If you want something the cheapest, you go to Amazon. I'll give you an example. My book on Amazon is $13.95. If I buy it at Barnes & Noble off the shelf, it's $21.95. Right. So you pay that right. extra $7 or $8. That makes no sense. And so for people that want to shop the cheapest, they're going to continue to shop online. But you know, a lot of these specialty retailers that are very high dollar, we're watching them contract. The revenues aren't increasing. They're closing down stores. And even stores like the dollar store are having problems. Um, the only side of the retail that I really think will always be strong is in the um, Lowe's sector, the uh, Home Depot sector. You know, Amazon and online okay. retailing really have hit that side of the retailing equation because people want it. It's a tangible purchase. They want a tool. They're looking for something specific. They want lawn and garden. They've got to see it and touch it. They want to remodel. They want carpet, they want tile, they want new cabinets, they want new, you know, new appliances. I don't see Amazon penetrating that space really ever. Well, uh, but I think bricks and clicks long-term, Rebecca, are the way to go. That, that's pretty interesting. So if somebody wanted to now consider about putting investments in stocks, a brick and click would be the way to go. You know, it really would. Um, if you were going to be an investor, like a Warren Buffett type that says, look, I want to know that where this company's gonna be in five years and I think they're gonna be explode, exploding, I think Walmart is a phenomenal hold for five years just to see the run that they're gonna give Amazon because if their internet uh, business keeps growing at let's say a 25 to 35% rate quarter over quarter, they are gonna become a real player, their stock is gonna explode similar to Amazon's. Okay, so let me ask you too, if there is somebody who says, I would really like to get involved with the stock market and I just don't have a lot of extra funds every month to invest in this, can I look at penny stocks and think that I can eventually make some money off of this? Is this something that is feasible or do you really need to look at something that is already established and going to end up having longevity because it's an established company? Yeah, you know, m most of the penny stocks don't have longevity. Uh, if you're lucky enough to get a penny stock that graduates, uh, let's say from the penny stock exchange up to the big boards, um, you know, that's kind of miraculous to say the least. And so that generally doesn't happen. Um, usually the companies that have really good ideas, good business models, uh, you know, projection of incredible rapid growth uh, are going to be companies that already go public, you know, and, and we see those companies like Uber and Lyft and, you know, uh, uh, what's the meat company? It's, it escapes me now. Um, you know who the meat companies I'm talking about with the vegetarian meat? Uh, meat no. Lift? There's a Beyond Meat. It's called Beyond Meat. They've all exploded. It's called Beyond Meat. And so they offer their, their meatless hamburger, you know, uh, uh, Burger King and a few other places, but it's all over the grocery store shelves, and I've had it. You know, it tastes just like meat, but it's plant-based, it's pea protein. Okay. Um, but these types of concepts, or what I'm talking about, will never show up on the, the penny stock exchange. So the penny stock exchange is not gonna make anybody uh, rich or help their retirement. 
this is all really good information to know. So if somebody really is starting to think about their finances, what they want to do in the future, how they want to, um, to really sort of strategically place themselves in comparison to where they are at now, they can do a couple of things. One, they can get a copy of your book. And another thing is they can get in contact with you to set up an appointment and you work. I mean, I know that you're certified, um, a senior advisor through the Soci Society of Senior um, Certified Senior Advisor Advisors out of Florida. You guys are also with the Florida Department of Financial Services, and you're completely um, certified. You're out. You're based out of Florida. So, if somebody in California wants to utilize your services, how, can they contact you via Skype or the telephone? How do you work? Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, what your viewership needs to know is that I'm a fiduciary and that's really what matters. Fiduciaries are registered investment advisors and we have a national presence. We can work in every state in the country. We have states and almost we have clients in almost every state in the country. Um, and so I think it's important uh, that if you if you like the things that we're talking about and they strike a chord with you, um, you call us direct. You call us direct at 321-795-4799. Or you go to our website at arbor, A-R-B-L-R dash financial .com, and you contact us by email that way and subscribe to our newsletter. Um, and of course, yeah. if you go to the website, you're going to see all of my media appearances. And I, I've spoken on every major large financial network there is, including Rebecca's, and she's grown a lot. So, you know, we'd like to come back at some point and talk to you guys again. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of the information. This is a lot to think about, especially if someone hasn't thought about these things before, because we are um, definitely taking a shift in the way things have gone for a long period of time. And while there has been sort of a slow change, it's starting to make a big impact. And so we're going to be seeing a lot more things. And I appreciate you being here and sharing that with the audience today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Rebecca. You take care. And I want to thank you for all tuning in to another episode of Rebecca Sounds Reveille. We ask that you share this show with your friends, your family, your loved ones, everybody you know on social media, and those you don't.